Carl Alvin Lycom Fanatics, thank you so much for showing up. Good <laughs> evening to welcome all of you to this wonderful KCRW event. My name is Henry Rollins. I'll be with you for the next few hours, days, for the rest of your life. Uh, before I get into anything else, I'm going to keep this really, really brief because we have a whole lot of music to play for you. Uh, I cannot tell you how happy I am to see all of you. Uh, I want you to understand exactly, as best as I can express to you, where I am coming from. Every Saturday from 6 to 8 p.m. when I'm on the air, it is the fastest two hours of my week when I'm in Los Angeles. I look up and it's always 7.40. I'm like, no! And, 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 and Liza's coming in to do her thing and all of a sudden I'm out of there going to Trader Joe's back on the 10 East and I'm going back into Los Angeles, back into my home which becomes such a drag because I still want to be on the air hanging out with you, being funny or trying to be and playing all this great music. And what I want to see when I walk back into my utilitarian hovel is this. A bunch of people hanging out going, you nail it on me! And tonight, we're going to do it. Now, the concept of this show came up months ago uh, when Liz and, and Rachel called me up and uh, told me to go to the K and, uh, and have a meeting about things. And so we piled into uh, Jen Farrell's office, or as I, or as I call her, General Jen Farrell. Uh, she's not in any way militant, but she is the boss. Anyway, uh, we went into her small utilitarian office and we sat down and uh, hashed out ideas on how to raise money for the K. And I said, I have an idea. And ladies and gentlemen, you're sitting in it tonight. This was my idea. If you listen to what I attempt to do on the radio every week, and I, I try and you know keep it interesting, keep it lively, but there is not, there are songs that I cannot play you over the air because they get downloaded and I would betray confidences. And that is one thing I do not want to do. People have given me music over the years. They said, don't give this away. Don't trade it. And I have to say, okay, and abide by that. And I think one should keep one's promises. And so let's talk briefly about the idea of trust. Almost all of you, unless you were dragged or abducted and, and brought into this place, all of you came in here tonight with a certain level of trust in me, and I was going to deliver to you the really good stuff. On the, on the same token, I have to trust you not to record or walk away with any of this stuff, because if you play it on the internet or whatever, I get in trouble, and you sell me out. And so, um, uh, the KCRW people, uh, they asked me to read a few things. Let's see. Um, no, and I, I did some rewriting, you know. Uh, no cell phones, photography, or recording devices of any kind. And then I wrote my own bullshit. It's a KCRW event. Anyone in violation will be gently asked to leave, to drive safely home, and to recycle whenever possible. If this was a KPCP event, we would stab you in the face! <clears throat> and so, now, the challenge of tonight's show is for me to bring you tracks, where hopefully the result after every single track is you going, damn! The narrow line with which I had to walk over the agonizing at least 10 drafts I put this show through that ended only at about 6 o'clock this morning, when I put the last track and went, it's done, leave it alone, walk away. I don't want to play something that's so generic, but you're like, so what? And I don't want to play something that's so obscure, you're like, so what? And so, I'm walking in the middle of it. The first track tonight is one of the only tracks we're going to play that does not require a bit of an anecdote or an explanation. I will keep them brief. I will be as succinct as possible. That's very difficult for me. But this one, uh, are you ready out there? The sound is on? Okay, we're gonna let this one go. This is the only song where, well, you've heard this song, you've heard it a bunch of times. If you have good taste in music, I think you should like this song. I bet you, you've not heard this song in this form. Uh, all I can say is, they sure knew how to make them in 1974. And hopefully this will work. Oh, there we go. She keeps a little shower in a pretty cabinet. Let the cake, she says, just like Marie Antoinette. A building a remedy for Green's job and dignity. Can you learn to do this? We're best in any kind. Extraordinarily nice. She's a killer. Queen, compadre, gentlemen. Dynamite with a laser beam. We all seem to blow you out. Anytime. You recommend it at the price. Insatiable. 
Zeit. Ich meine Zeit. She never kept the same address In conversation She spoke just like a baroness A little man who tried to get you by Then again, incidentally You better than cry Oh, you better than cry Oh, you better than cry Oh, you better than cry She couldn't care less, prestigious and precise She's a killer, queen, gun body, jumping teen Get a mind with a laser beam Can I see you to blow your mind? Someone has abducted the master tapes and had some fun. I wonder who that was. I will not divulge my sources because hopefully from these sources I'll be getting some Bohemian Rhapsody tracks in at some point. When we get together again and do something like this again, maybe we'll get into that. So, you knew this was coming, fanatics. Here's a little bit of black flag music. Time ago, some of you who are sleeping or incarcerated, uh, you, uh, you, you uh, might, upon release, have found out that a little bit past Los Angeles International Airport in the sleepy town of Redondo Beach, there was a song band called Black Flag, who recorded obsessively over a period of many years with four different singers. The songs would be recorded over and over and over again, sometimes changing the lyrics, and uh, at one point, a compilation album, some of the outtakes called Everything Went Black, was released, and uh, I went into the studio with Spot, the producer, as he combed through hours of quarter-inch tapes. I went in there with my cassettes and recorded everything I could, me being a fan and someone who was also in the band. So it kind of sounds like I'm doing a hair club for men. And there. But anyway, uh, in my humble opinion, the first singer in Black Flag, Keith Morris, was A, the best, and also one of the greatest singers ever to stand on a stage anywhere and hold a microphone. He is a man. And so, what I'm going to play you is a track that there is no way that you heard. It's an early version of a song called I've Heard It Before, which first made its appearance on the six-pack EP with the great Des Kadena singing Black Flag's third vocalist. This has a different lyric. The track is called Just Give Us a Break. Same music, different lyric, with Keith. No, no, no. You have never heard this before until now. <laughs> Thank you. 
Fire, the Black Flag recorded obsessively the same songs over and over and over again. I think Greg Ginn, the band's creator, was not getting the sound that he wanted. And so the band ended up with lots of versions of the songs. And I think uh, being bored or feeling very creative, one night Chuck Dukowski, the band's bass player, Ron Reyes, otherwise known as Chavo, the band's second singer, and Spot, the band's erstwhile producer, took it upon themselves to get together around the microphone and throw themselves into an insane version of the song Depression. Spot also plays spontaneous piano. Uh, so you're going to hear it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a mess. Uh, but you've never heard this before. It could be one of the rarest things that you ever black, you know, black like ever did. It was made into a rough mix where it was resided deep on a TDK 60 I had in my garage until, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Went, Aha! I knew I still had this! And so uh, you're going to listen to, uh, this thing is a damn train wreck, but we'll see if we can. Oh, oh, I can hear myself. That's fun. short tour of America with a very, very unique lineup that did not last very long. It was the two guitar lineup featuring uh, Des Kadena on guitar, Greg Ginn on guitar, Chuck Dukowski on bass, me on vocals, and the very amazing, very young Chuck Biscuits from DOA on drums. And he was one of the most solid and explosively exciting drummers I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen anything like this guy. If any of you ever saw him with DOA or Danzig, where he was playing more mid-tempo stuff, but on the faster stuff, he's absolutely explosive. And he did not last in the band all that long. He's, uh, we were going at two different tempos. He, we were kind of workaholic maniacs trying to eat the world alive. He was a little bit more laid back. And at one point, we had very little money, but we wanted to go into the studio. Studio and Greg wanted to play all the new songs that we had at the time, so we went in and we recorded 
crazy, like for like 15 straight hours, spot made a quick mix of it all onto a cassette, and I think some of it has leaked out over the years on the bootlegs here and there, but you have uh, basically a Black Flag album that is sitting ready to be mixed that could come out and blow some minds. It's a very unique lineup, and I remember the playing being very fierce. That being said, there is something to be said for being very, very young and being very angry and starving, because it will manifest itself in your music, and there's something that happens to a musician when they get a little bit of a paycheck and they get a slight comfort layer. There's something in the music loses its anger and innate hunger. And what you're about to hear is a track that never got vocals put on it. It was uh, one of the, it's like one of the last great things, in my opinion, but one of the last great things that Greg Ginn did as a songwriter that never got completed. And he did attempt to write some lyrics for it like a year later, a lyrical mirror girl. We tried it at Soundcheck somewhere in Canada. It just didn't work and we never brought it up again. And to me, it was always that, that thing that bugged me that we never activated this song. So what I'm going to play you is the instrumental version. That's all there is. It's nicknamed in the studio is Chipmunk One. I have no idea why the studio, you know, these working titles take on a life of their own. What you're going to hear is Chuck Biscus at the height of his power. And again, it is only the sound that a lean, hungry, very angry bunch of ambitious young men can do. Because once you get a little comfortable, you will never sound like what you are about to hear. Whoops, wrong one. Sorry about that. Here we go. <laughs>
I, I thought that was one of uh, Greg's uh, little monster masterpieces, and I, I wish it you know, had come uh, a little further. Back in those days, I was living in an abandoned van in the parking lot of a liquor store, and it was uh, a van that other band members would utilize. Well, it was kind of the hotel that we had, and someone meets a nice gal from the Midwest, and you know, hold hands, and you want a place to be alone, like you know, the secret knock. Well, which is the beginning of a song called I've Had It, and so you knew it was not the cops, it was the all clear. And I'd be right about to go to sleep on this mattress that had other uses. And, and I get the knock, I'm like, really? It's like, I didn't have a watch. It's like, it must be really late, and I'd have to get out. I'll walk to the beach, I'll come back. Are you guys done yet? And then I would go back in there, and then the cops would park next to the it ever did is on that song it was a, a seven inch on Posh Boy, but not on SST. And for some reason, the band did Louie Louie, and I improvised a vocal, and Spot made a quick mix of it, and it disappeared. And I never got to hear it again. And a few years ago, I was like, I remember we did Louie Louie. I, you know, I know I did it. I'll never get to hear it again. And one day, I had some old cassette on the uh, stereo at the office. I was basically playing it in real time just to log it and see what was on it. And in the middle of this cassette, voila, the Louie Louie with my vocal on it appears. Some of you have heard of this woman who's been assisting me at my office for the last 13 years. Her name is Heidi, who nicknamed her the demon. Her nickname is Trouble. Whenever she hears me sing from this ear, she goes, oh, it's baby Henry! Because the voice sounds like certain parts of my anatomy had not yet dropped. And so, this is vintage, a vintage baby Henry vocal, a true outtake from the damaged album. I guarantee you, you've never heard this before. change, shall we? Uh, there's some guy, he's very tall, I know he's Australian, named Nick Cave. Uh, a pal of mine, and uh, like many of you, you heard the birthday party, I heard the birthday party, went drop everything, this is the best band on earth. And I got to see them uh, March 30th, 1983, when they did two sets at the Roxy. And uh, some of the Black Flag guys were backstage watching Nick Cave and Tracy Pugh, the band's bass player, get ready for the show. And uh, Dave O, Black Flag soundman, said they, they took a massive amount of speed, chopped it into two massive piles, both like, let's play, and they went out and played, and, and uh, the next night, Nick Cave was at a Minutemen show, and I walked up to his table at Club Lingerie, and I said, hi, I'm the guy in black flag, you put us on the guest list last night, you know, I have all the songs you ever did, you know that time that you did that, and he's like, oh no, I'm trapped with a maniac who's going to ask me about everything I've ever recorded, and I did, and somehow we've been pals ever since. Now, about a summer later, Nick Cave uh, started some band called Nick Cave and the Bad Seats, and he went into the studio and recorded an album that was called, ended up being 
called From Her to Eternity. And it is basically a live album in the studio. They basically captured the album. They did take after take, trying different things. If you listen to the record, it is a massive stroke of genius. It's also a wild, combustible thing that they managed to corral onto tape. What Nick Cave and company did not know is that someone whose name I will not say uh, slipped a cassette into the tape deck and kept a cassette rolling as these uh, very talented young men rolled through different versions of their songs. There was an occasion where Nick Cave sat down on his own and played a song. And to give you a little bit of context, I'm going to play you a little bit of the studio version of the song, then we're going to listen to this super sneaky rare version that Nick Cave has no idea of the existence of. This person, the entity, gave me this cassette around 1984 or 5 and said, here's what I did, keep it to yourself. And so I, I kept it to myself and I you know, played it and played it and I could never tell Nick, I've got this cool tape of you doing this thing and you, and because he would get mad at this, the entity. And not wanting to bust this person, but eventually this person, the entity, had his or her place broken into and lost most of their possessions and I became the only one with the cassette unless this person made copies for someone else. I have no idea. So we're going to listen right now to a few moments, well a little bit, of the original studio version of From Her to Journey from the album From Her to Journey. No doubt you're very familiar with the track, but it'll give us a little bit of, of uh, context. <laughs> So all of you are familiar with that. So now we're going to hear this super sneaky version that Mr. Cave has no idea exists. So if you tell him, oh, we're just screwed, that's all. Okay, here we go. Let's see if I can get this right. Thank you. 
Okay, so we're going to go a little bit backwards in uh, one more Nick Cave thing that'll make sense in a few minutes. Um, I used to be in that tape trading game where you'd wait you know, for that huge chimney pack from Germany to come with all of those cassettes. I was one of those annoying bastards. But I ended up with a lot of really cool stuff and I, I tried to find it at every birthday party live show that I could and I'd write these people. And this is real-time analog mail. Like you go to the mailbox, did the guy write me back? Nerds, not today. Come on, Hamburg, Germany, come back. And it was not the immediate gratification that we all enjoy with the internet is like you wait as this as the postman hopefully is whistling your tune and at one point I was given a cassette of the birthday party and they played a song that I never heard to play again on any of my live tapes it is a version of them doing Little Doll from the first Stooges album and uh, I don't have the first Stooges album with me to play a little bit of that song for context I'm going to hope that you have heard that album it's a perfect album and so it's about a minute and 50 seconds we're going to listen to the birthday party doing their version from November 6th, 1981, in a place called Eindhoven, Holland, which, uh, the Eindhoven contingent is here. So obviously we're playing the FNR, right? So some of you have been to the old FNR, so you can think of an in-cave and company banging out this amazing Stooges track, which we're going to get into right now. Thank you for the great efforts of other people. I, uh, anyway, 
Uh, I played you that because it's going to lead us into something that I think you're going to find extremely overwhelmingly cruel. All of you know of some guy named Iggy Pop and his band The Stooges. Many, many years ago, uh, like some of you perhaps, I encountered a bootleg called Rough Power, which was rough mixes of the Raw Power album. Apparently the legend is that Iggy had rough mixes of the Raw Power album that he took to WABC or some station in Michigan to play before the album came out because he was so excited. Someone bootlegged the radio show and it, it, it came out on LP and eventually CD. I heard these mixes and I heard on the song Raw Power, which is one of the greatest lyrics and one of the greatest songs ever, I hear backing vocals that I'm not really sure I was hearing on David Bowie's fairly anemic mix uh, of the original album mix. I said, well, if I ever got my hands on those master tapes, I'd be pushing those backing vocals up because I want to hear them. And years later, I actually did get my hands on the multi-track master. When I was in uh, Holland in 1987, me and my bandmates were practicing getting ready for a European tour, we heard a tall tale that the multi-track master of the Raw Power album had been stolen from England where the band recorded it, and it found itself up in Belgium. We went, well, that's an interesting thing. And apparently people at the studio had been fooling around making their own mixes. And this kind of festered in the minds of myself and Chris Haskett, our guitar player. And a few years later, we said, that's it. We're getting to the bottom of this. And I think Chris Haskett got the very considerable talents of one of the guys of in Tuxedo Moon, Dan Brown, who's living in Belgium at the time, and said, find that tape. And I think he said, you know what? I know that studio, I can find that tape. And so he went into the studio and said, the Rollins band wants Iggy's tape back. And the, the equitable Belgian owner of the studio went, here. And we found ourselves in Eindhoven, Holland, and a man walks backstage with this plastic bag and said, this is for you. And we pull out the two-inch master of the Raw Power album. No problem, we're leaving to Moscow the next day. There's no way we're taking this place into Russia either even though the wall had come down. And so we said, no, 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 it has to go elsewhere. So we bundled it up and we sent it off to London where Chris Haskett retrieved it weeks later as he was visiting, took it back to New York, went over to Iggy's place at 6th and B and said, you're a tape, sir. And Iggy was practicing down the hallway from us at Context one day and I knocked on the door and went in and I said, hey, Jim. Hey, man. And I said, Tim, you know, that tape, you know, I think Bowie didn't give you the righteous mix. There's some backing vocals on Raw Power that I think you should explore. You should remix that album, man. And he said, how do I do that, man? I said, you let me go to Sony and hook it up. And that's back in the days when a mere mortal could walk into Sony without being patted down and waterboarded. Times are different now. And I went over my manager. We sat down with, I believe, Rick Griffiths. Uh, he was there before he was made to walk the plank. And we said, here's a pitch. You sent Iggy into the studio to remix mixed raw power and you let that happen. He went, here's a whole bunch of money. Went, well, damn. And so I said, hey, Iggy, he's giving you, uh, you know, the freedom to ride. And so uh, he went, okay, man. And he came out to LA to record, uh, I think, believe, uh, it was the Naughty Little Doggy album. And he came over to my office and to hear, which was the sound of all of my employees, well, the people at my book company, their jaws hit the ground as Iggy walks into the office and goes, hey, man, my name is Jim. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, they're still not getting over it. And he gave me the, the two-inch master of raw power. I said, I don't know what to do with it, man. And I did. You take it to the studio, you back it up digitally and analog as soon as you can. So I took it to Westlake, because they can do reproduction. And I said, look, I'm coming in with a two-inch 16-track tape. Can you recalibrate your machines? And we're going to go analog and digital at the highest IPS rate with analog. And they said, we can do that. When are you showing up? I said, when you're ready. They said, come in a few hours. So I walk in and I find out that Joe Strummer and Rat Scabies were working down the hall mixing a soundtrack. I walk into the front of Westlake with the two inch. Joe Strummer runs out, puts his hands on the two inch and says, The Grill. 
and that runs back to his room to mix. And so we set up the tape decks, and we make a very uh, high uh, IPS rate do analog, and we make a simultaneous uh, uh, digital dub, and then we leave the master analog alone. And for the rest of the evening, the studio was so happy that they had this thing in their studio, they let me make mixes for a few hours for free, no studio time. And so I said, well, uh, who gets a chance to do this? And so I said, well, let's, let's listen to Raw Power. Let's get those backing vocals up. And so I made this mix with the backing vocals up, and the door opens, and Joe Strummer walks in. He stands next to me, puts his hand on my shoulder, looks up at the speakers, looks down at me and says, carry on, my son. And I was like, that's it. Hit me with a car, because my life is never getting better than this moment right now. And so, just for the hell of it, let's listen to just a moment or two of the original mix of Raw Power so you can hear what you're missing, and then we'll listen to my mix, which is un-EQ'd, unmastered, uncompressed, it sounds like it sounds, it was made at 3 o'clock in the morning by an amateur mixing guy, moi, on a complete lack of sleep. So we'll get through this as best we can. I think you will appreciate the uh, other version for some attributes I will describe after this, this brief uh, contextual play of the Bowie version. Okay, so that's the David Bowie version, you know, that's the original release version of the song, all of you are familiar with uh, that one. So now we're going to listen to this one. It is about 30 seconds longer, so you can get the live guitar, outro, not the fade, backing vocals up, as far as EQing bass guitar, I did a very quick thing, I, I got what I got, I, I think it, it will pass muster, and uh, so this is my mix of uh, the great classic Raw Power by Iggy and the Stooges.
those master tapes. So that was uh, that was pretty cool, right? Okay, so uh, let's stay with Iggy for just one more moment. Uh, years ago, I was uh, working on a record down the street from Sixth and B, where Iggy was living at the time, and uh, me and my bandmates were working on an album called Wait inside a room that was owned by Michael Girard of the Swans, and he had left for the summer to go down to Atlanta because the weather was cooler, and uh, he was there, I guess, working with Jarbo on some project, and I said, can I rent your practice space so me and my guys can work? He said, sure. And if you've ever heard any music of the Swans, you can imagine what Michael Girard's practice place is like. The, the ceiling is this high over your head, and you think you're living in some Kafka-esque nightmare. And so we wrote the, the, the way out inside this airless room. It was like this hot box from hell. And uh, at one point, he came around to come visit. He walks in, and, and he, we're like standing around being miserable. Like, we're just like sweated out. It's just, it's utterly awful. And uh, he said, this place is pretty cool. And my drummer Sim looks at him and was like, he went, Maybe not. <laughs> and, and, and so at one point, uh, I was over at his place. He has a, he had a cool uh, loft apartment down around the corner. And he gives me this cassette. It has nothing on it, just a black cassette. He went, here. I went, all right. And I took it back to this apartment I was living in. And I figured it was uh, a, a version of a song that he and I did together on his uh, American Caesar album called Wild America. I said, well, I, I, I've heard this before. I'll just put it on the shelf, and I'll listen to it one day. And like two nights later, I said, I wonder what was on that cassette. I mean, if Iggy Pop gave you a cassette, wouldn't you just like, just hurry up and play it? Like, what was I thinking? And so I put it on, and it's Iggy, solo, acoustic, playing. And I'm listening to the lyrics, I'm like, wow, those lyrics are really, man, he must have had a really bad day. Those are really awful. I mean, like, tortured, like, miserable. Sounds like something I would write. Wait a minute. I did write this. And I'm like, I, wait a minute. And I, I, I called him. I said, hey, Jim, that tape, it sounds like it was... I gave you that tape two days ago, man, and you didn't call me. I thought I made your man. I said, no, I didn't you know, I had my head up my ass. I didn't play it. Is that, is that me? He goes, yeah, I was looking at one of your books, man, and I thought I'd make a song out of one of your things. So I was like, okay, that's it. Maybe now's the time to go run into traffic because that might be one of the highest compliments I've ever been paid. And so he called the track Untouchable, and uh, I have a copy. I, maybe Jim has a copy. Maybe he does. Uh, but you're going to hear it right now.
celebrate 40 years of existence and they've asked someone to not only host it but to get on stage and also sing with the Stooges. <laughs> anyway, that should be interesting for that lucky old son of a bitch. So, uh, there used to be some band from the middle of England called Black Sabbath. And a long time ago they did an album called a Black Sabbath. What you might not know is there's some outtakes from the album A Black Sabbath. Now, if you go on the internet, you can find a song called The Rebel that sounds very tortured, like a cassette of a cassette of a cassette. It's a later version of the song that they put a whole bunch of schmutz on it, bells and whistles, and somehow I came into access of um, complete CDs of all the master tapes. And so we're going to hear an earlier version of the song The Rebel without all the bells and whistles without the copy of a copy of a copy you're going to hear a clean version right off the master of the undubbed take one master of a true classic black sabbath outtake and this is uh something you're not going to hear in this form anytime soon i don't think unless sharon osborne sees fit to release it if she's here tonight please don't kill me rebel take one Oh, 
but I think the explanation is worth it. Lodi, New Jersey, some band called The Misfits. Now, that's another band that recorded obsessively, hence the box set The Misfits put out with five versions of this, two versions of that. They were always looking for that sound they recorded over and over and over again. There was at one point when I believe that Dave Vanian of The Damned was dating a Lodi girl, so Lodi, New Jersey, he found himself in the Misfits neighborhood. Glenn Danzig wanted to write a song for him called Archangel, saying, here's your single. And so Dave said, well, okay, something transpired. And uh, Glenn Danzig got together with Jerry Only, and together they uh, put down on tape this song Archangel with Glenn Danzig doing guide vocals. I think Glenn played guitar, bass, Jerry played, sorry, uh, guitar and drums, Jerry played bass, and then later on, uh, Glenn came back in and did the vocals. Years later, uh, Glenn Danzig had a song called uh, Archangel uh, in his band Sam Hain. It's the same basic backing track, new bass, new vocal, different guitar. I think the trick, he left the drums, perhaps because he played up. He played those drums, and the rest he overdubbed. And so this is one of the great missing Misfits tracks, the official Misfits version with the Jerry only count in, the original Glenn vocal and Glenn playing everything but the, uh, the, the, the bass, which is Jerry's job at that time. Uh, all of that uh, has never been released. And if you go into Misfits Central, I, I think they'll tell you that. There is someone on the internet saying, here's the Misfits version. It is, in fact, uh, the Sam Hain version. So it's not uh, it's not the real one. Now, many years ago, Ben Danzig gave me a bunch of cassettes of all of the outtakes. And I think he said to me, don't copy that thing anymore. <laughs> to which I said, okay. And so I'm not copying it. I'm just playing it. <laughs> Thank you. 
I must say, of all the tracks that I brought here tonight, that was the one I almost didn't bring, Fearing the Wrath. So if you record that one, I'll have to leave this state. Or I'll end up, who the hell knows. Now, that is the first half of the evening. It's going to get gooder and gooder as it goes. Some of you are probably aware of some band called Public Enemy. Chuck D, one of the great voices of our generation and one of the great minds of the rap genre. And he's a really good guy. And many years ago, in 1986, I was still in Black Flag, and I stopped through Washington, D.C. and my, my good friend of 37 years, Ian Mackay, said, check out this tape. And we're driving around, and he pops in this tape, and he plays me what basically was the Public Enemy demo for the first Public Enemy album, Yo, Bum Rush the Show. It was what I had been waiting for rap to do for years. A James Brown beat with the voice of such authority he wanted to stop the car and say, you're right about everything. <laughs> the demo version of Yo Bum Rush the Show is nothing like the one that Rick Rubin produced. The Rick Rubin version is very nice. The demo version that you were about to experience has Flavor Flav saying some very naughty things. And so for your listening pleasure right now, this is Public Enemy from 1986, a full year before Yo Bum Rush the Show came out. <laughs>
I think 1995 in Germany, we were doing an outdoor festival with the Chili Pepper Suicidal Tendencies, Public Enemy, and Public Enemy's trailer dressing room was next to ours. And I kept running over to see if they had arrived, because I had never met them. And uh, we're about to go on, I hope they get to see me, and you know, my wanted just them to see us play. And I keep looking over there, but PE had not arrived. And so we go out there and we play our 12 songs, or whatever they gave us that day, and I journey back and shower off and there's still no public enemy. I'm like, oh well, they, oh, I'll never get to meet them. And all of a sudden, I am assaulted by someone has grabbed me in a bear hug. It's Chuck D. And he grabbed me and went like, wow! I'm like, you're Chuck D! And he said to me, he said, every time I'm on stage and I get tired, I think to myself, what would Henry Rollins think if he saw me out here wheezing and I get up and I play harder? And I said, well, Time for the lightning bolt to drop on me and kill me. And then Flavor Flav comes running up to me, all of like 80 pounds dripping wet, and throws himself on me and hugs me. He goes, I don't know who you are, man, but if Chuck likes you, you must be okay. And he just held on to me. And I guess we've been kind of pals ever since. Now, to, um, to uh, rip ourselves into a different genre altogether, but not really, if we're still going to be talking about rap, there was a guy a guy named Didi Ramon, who somewhere in the 80s decided that he was going to be a rapper. Some of you remember this, his first 12 inch was called Funky Man, and then he went to his uh, employers at Sire Records and said, I have an idea, I'm going to change my name to Didi King, I'm going to look like this now, and I'm going to be a rapper. And the record label went, oh, oh no. And so Dee King put out, standing in the spotlight, I am a paper fanatic. Flyers, set lists, promotional items, if it's paper, I'm probably interested. Here's the original Dee Dee King press release. No one will sign this. No one will author this. There is no name of who to call for more information on this thing. You can read the pain that this person went through. By 500 words and I can leave. If I can just evince words on the page, I am out of here. What did this person have to work with? Promotional photos like this. And even Bob Gruen, who took this photo, must not have wanted to be there because his name is misspelled. It's G-R-U-I-N, and that is not the spelling of his name. And I'm not trying to in any way denigrate the considerable talents of Dee Dee Ramon, because he wrote all those Ramon songs that you like so much. He wrote them. 
whether they're rap stuff. Well, so let's uh, let's let's experience the discomfort of a few paragraphs of the press release. You can oh the pain, the pain. It's like if you can't pay this person enough per word, they want to get out of their office. The street level is the same. So are the cutting edge lyrics, the razor sharp humor, and the intensity and integrity that grab you from the first cut. Even the face on the cover is familiar. But that's about as far as the comparisons stretch. In fact, any similarity between D.D. King, one of rap's most innovative new arrivals, and his creator, D.D. Ramon, exists only in the ear of the beholder. As one of the founding members of and bassist for the Ramones, one of the modern rock's most influential groups, D.D. Ramon has taken a startling and sensational step in a new musical direction with his rapping alter ego, D.D. King. The proof is on dazzling display on Standing in the Spotlight, D.E. King's debut album on Sire Records. One of the most upfront, exciting, explosively entertaining entries so far this year. Standing in the Spotlight features nine D.E. Make That King rap originals, plus a hip-hop version of Mashed Potato, spelled wrong, that blows other recent dance craze remakes right off the floor. In some ways, D.D. King is the next logical step through the man behind the words of Gimme Gimme Shot Treatment, Sheena is a punk rocker, Lobotomy, and Rockaway Beach. In other words, it's as completely unexpected as Dr. Jekyll's transformation into Mr. Hyde. And so, since the, uh, the press person mentioned the song Mashed Potato, I think that we should listen to the track which is actually called Mashed Potato Time. And it's Dee Dee King rapping, helped out by the sublime backing vocals of one Deborah Harry, who makes the thing really beautiful. So we're going to listen to a little bit of Mashed Potato Time, and then we'll continue with our Dee Dee saga. A very strange evening, one evening at NYU, Hal Wilner and I went over there to watch Diamanda Galas perform a thing she called Insecta, where she sat in a cage, just suspended over the audience, and did her thing. It was one of the most punishing and terrifyingly brilliant things I've ever seen. I've seen her many times. This was her best performance. So Hal and I, you know, we scam our way backstage so we can pay our respects to the great Diamanda. And who's standing back there but Deborah Harry? I go all gushy inside. She is insanely gorgeous. And I'm standing she walks up and she says, Hello, Henry. I was like, oh. And I said to her, like, Hi, I'm, I'm Henry. I know. Okay, well, thanks. Bye. And how and I legged it out of there. It was just one of those great nights. And so now, uh, we're going to listen to a little bit of Dee Dee King and Debbie Harry doing Mashed Potato Time. It's time to rock. It's time to rap. It's time for the Mashed Potato Time.
doubt the Air Force never recovered. Um, so, uh, which leads me into this. Several months ago, I was at Linda Ramone's house, and uh, it was a, an evening garden party at Linda's. Johnny had passed away, and I meet Dee Dee's first wife, Vera, and she's a very nice lady, and she said, I heard you like Dee Dee King. Yeah, why wouldn't you? And she produces from her pocket two CDs, and she said, here are two CDs of unreleased D.D. King. Would you like to have them? <laughs> yes, please. And I said, can I play them on my radio show? To which she said, <laughs> no. And so one or two of these tracks have leaked out onto the internet. You can find them if you want. There's a track called Max the Cat that has to be heard to be believed. Knowing that some of you are quite fanatic and tenacious, uh, you may have heard it. So I'm going to play you a track that you have not heard. It's a track, one of these unreleased tracks. It's uh, Dee Dee in full paranoia mode. Uh, some unseen entity was after him. One night, I was with him in his room at the Chelsea Hotel. It's a small room. He had a mattress, a boom box, and a couple of guns. You know, living the high life. And he said, hey, let's go outside. And I said, okay, let's go outside. And we're about to go outside. He said, but the cops might assassinate us. I'm like, you know, you really have to change whatever you're ingesting every day because the cops are not going to assassinate you. We're in the 30s. I mean, we're in the you know, 30th and whatever. They don't do that in this neighborhood. And so we went, okay. And we went outside and the poor guy was, you know, he had some real intensity going on in his mind there. And he was utterly terrified to walk on the street. And I said, Dee, no one's going to assassinate you. We're just going to get some food. Okay. And then later that night, he calls me at like three in the morning. We have to go to the airport. We have to go to Berlin now. I said, Berlin now? The cops are going to kill me. Wow. So his, his challenges were very, very real. And so uh, maybe this song, The Goon, has something to do with that. Look what I did. I had the volume down. Hold on, hold on. All right, let's see if I can get it to go now. There's a goon in the house. Not so sweet, I can't stop laughing. Goes a lot. You won't need a stand. Out of the goon. He does things he's like to come. Goes a lot. He's in the park. I'm holding my hand. The goon's got his hand. I'm an expert at rapping with the yo-yo I'm rocking the mic like a psycho Been rapping since the age of ten Been rapping Swedish or African German, Japanese, Catholic If I breathe, the goon can't rap The goon is stuck up He ain't there, it's nothing but We should have a contest to see Who's the best? Me or the goon that come a fool I'm the king of Manhattan Gonna battle him at last He's a sucker on the mic He's got nice, no regrets He's got no rhythm in his bones Should I fuck with me, you remote? G-O-O in time for rapping One, two, three, four, five Gonna steal your ass a lot Five, six, seven, eight, nine Gonna kiss you to the night Jack and Jill will go You're a goon Yeah. 
songs that you like, you know, like all of them, Dee Dee wrote them. He was an amazing songwriter. His foray into the rap world, well, you, know, you gotta try it before you go. Life is short. You might as well, you know, try and do all you can. So, let's stay with the Ramones for just a second. It is important for me to play you a moment of this song because it will add context to what we're about to hear. So, you're going to hear a little bit of a song called I Don't Want You from the fourth Ramones album called Road to Ruin. Whoa! Studio Ramones album, and it marked the leaving of Tommy Ramone, the original drummer, and the advent of Marky Ramone, who became the band's drummer for a very, very long time. And so, after Johnny Ramone passed away years ago, I was over at Linda Ramone's house, where Johnny and Linda used to live. And I said, Linda, I'm sure that Johnny has a whole lot of tapes and flyers and set lists and memorabilia. You have to understand, your husband's band is one of the most important parts of rock history, at least to people like me. Everything in this house needs to be databased. Anything that is carbon needs to be backed up. It needs to be scanned, digitized for, for the, you know, for Ever. And she said, that's that's pretty important. I go, you're sitting on a lot of really important stuff. If you would let me, I would like to go through some of the boxes and make sure that everything is looked after. Would that be okay? She said, okay. And so together we uh, took a long afternoon and we went foraging into the closets of the Ramon, Johnny Ramon's residence and we found boxes of ticket stubs. He would keep tickets of every gig and baseball game he went to. We're finding tickets, Stooges, the Hoople at the Fillmore East. Amazing show. So Johnny went to a lot of gigs. We found this one box of cassettes, and I'm going through them, and I, one cassette looks really interesting. I pull it out, and there's like this kind of crazy scrawl handwriting on it, and I go, Linda, what do you know about this? And she looks at it, and she goes, well, I know that that is Joey's handwriting. So you, it's really hard to read it. What does it say? She says, it says, I don't want you. Really? Joey Ramone has a cassette in Johnny Ramone's closet that says, I don't want you. You'll get this back at the end of the semester. And so I took it back to my place and I popped it into uh, the, the tape deck. And what I heard, it, it blew my mind. My jaw hit the ground. You were about to hear Joey Ramone, solo acoustic, working out the song, I Don't Want You. No doubt, he worked out the song. He gave the cassette to Johnny Ramone and said, hey, learn this. Johnny learned it very quickly, put the tape away, and perhaps never played it again until it was played, oh, about 30 years later. So now you're going to hear something where I, I thought I had discovered, you know, Tut's other tomb or something. It was one of those massive revelations when you are standing in your room going, oh, oh, I wish I had a room full of people in Silver Lake to play this to. And now I do. Thank you. 
the front desk of that year ago. Years ago, I was living down the street from CB's, CBGB's in New York, and it was a it was freezing uh, nights in New York where it's just catastrophically cold. So I staggered up from this apartment I was living in, and I went into CB's to see the Dictators, a great band. And on stage right, on your way to the restrooms, there's a little place to stand where you don't get slammed into. And I'm watching the Dictators do one of the best sets I've ever seen them do. They were just incredible. And I look to my side, and I, I, I'm standing next to someone who's exceedingly Exceedingly tall, and I look up, and it's, it's Joey Ramon, and I kind of nudged him, and he looked down. Oh, hey, you like the dictators? I said every day, and uh, we just stood there and watched the dictators kind of rocking out next to each other. And after the show was over, Joey and I went to hang out with the dictators, and someone was there with a camera and took some photos. And, and for the rest of my life, I was trying to track down that photo because I want to see me and Joey Ramon in a photograph, because I know it happened. And so I was talking to Mandy Stein, uh, whose father signed the Ramones, and I said, this happened, I, I want to find this photo. She said, I'm on it. And she went out and she sleuthed and sleuthed, and one night she sent me this JPEG, voila. And there's me with remarkably dark hair, uh, standing next to Joey Ramone. <laughs> one of those, one of those great nights. And so, one of the other cassettes that I found in this massive stash uh, of stuff in Linda's closet was this cassette that said Ramones Agora Live and Live in Agora in Ohio. And so I sourced a track from it, a great live version of "I Want to Be Sedated," where uh, Marky had just uh, joined the band. So you're going to hear a little bit of historical from uh, from Joey before they go into the song. And I don't know how it is for you, but when I listen to the Ramones, I embarrass myself. I have a Pavlovian response to Ramones music. When I hear Dee Dee count in, I go into rock face and I start acting like an idiot. And, and it's because the band moves me so much from the first time I saw them when Dee Dee sweated on me in a place that's now a Chinese restaurant in a strip mall in, in Falls Church, Virginia. It used to be Louis Rock City. And back in those days, they, the place could hold like 300 people, but they lose people up 700, 701. And by the time the, the Ramones went on, there was nowhere to do it. And the Ramones walked out like, good evening, the Ramones, and I've never been the same. It was one of the most moving experiences of my life. And, and so you're going to hear a little bit of this tape. And I gave all this stuff back to Linda. I said, Linda, here's the CDs, here's the cassettes. You own this stuff. Do something with it. This is, you're sitting on the damn gold mine. Ramones fans would go nuts. Or at least, you know, a few people in Silver Lake. So let's get into it. <laughs>
stood in front of them. You left that show and went, everything is different now. I believe it was June of 1979, the Damned came to town to play at a venue called The Bayou, which looked out on the Potomac River. And they had an opening band that we had only heard rumor and legend of. Ian Mackay and I knew that somewhere in Washington, D.C., there was an all-black punk rock band called The Bad Brains. The Damned had heard about The Bad Brains and said, put that band on the bill. And so we find out that we're going to get this not only get to see the dam, but we're also going to get to see the bad brains. We had never seen them. We had no you know, idea of what they sounded like. And so we ventured down to the bayou. I was 18 and a few months, so I had legal ID. Ian was underage, incredibly underage, and we made him the worst fake ID imaginable with his mother's Polaroid camera. I just got back a few feet. We took this awful photo where he looks kind of baked orange. We taped it onto a piece of paper. It, it, it was awful. And thankfully the security guy did look at the ID and Ian was in. And the Bad Brains went on stage in front of about 50 or 60 people who were there basically at doors. And here comes four handsome, angry, intense young black men. The guitar player, Gary, but Dr. No that night. Dr. No comes out on stage in green OR scrubs, splattered in red paint, like he's covered in blood. He's the bad doctor. Oh, oh shit, that's so punk rock. And the singer, HR, is in this suit that's been torn and slashed and stitched and stapled and chained back together. We're like, ah! And they basically played for 35 minutes and the entire crowd ran to the back, except me and Ian and a few other people who ran to the front and stared up in amazement as our DNA was uncoiled, recoiled. It was never the same after that. And after that, like 1,200 people from Elvis, every suburb around the D.C. area, steamed in to watch the dam. who were tremendous. And Ian Mackay's sister got hit in the head with a bottle. Her head exploded in beautiful blood going over her amazing blonde hair, rat scabies, pulls Ian's bleeding sister up on stage. It was one of the greatest nights. Ian's sister's head got caved in by a bottle. She gets to hang out with the dam. It was one of those nights. We went staggering out, holding on to Katie, who was belligerent with her blood drying in her beautiful blonde hair. And we went, wow, Katie's going to be okay, but bad brains. And one song in particular, a song called Pay to Come, we watched it and we went, what? How does a human do that? How does that guy sing that? What are they doing? We could not understand that song. And so we nicknamed the song Higgity Higgity. Because they were like, we said, like, sing it. And we all imitate. Because like, Higgity 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 Fight! Because we couldn't figure out what the hell HR was singing. And so there, there came a time uh, when the Bad Brains actually went and to record the Pay to Come single. They went up to New York and they recorded it. And they came back down and the single was ready. And they had no car to go to New York to pick up the single. So they went to Ian. Ian, can we borrow your car? Ian, a sensible young man, said, absolutely not. And they came to me. Can we borrow your car? Me being a big fan said, sure! Here's my 1968 VW Fastback with a dent in the hood from when the cop hit it with a mace canister in one of those riots my mom and I found ourselves caught in. And he said, you gave the bad brains your car? What can go wrong? And so days later, a week later, the Bad Brains go back to D.C. with like a thousand of the first Bad Brains singles stuffed in the car. I got the car back, and for my trouble, they gave me a single. The single version of this song is perhaps the most determinant 
song of my existence. I have never heard anything like it. It was my total inspiration for ever wanting to be in a band. It is to this day one of the most incredible 90 seconds of your life. So right now, we're going to listen to the single version, which is absolutely amazing. Try and clock HR's vocal delivery. Catch him if you can. <laughs> put this into context. There was absolutely nothing like this at the time. We heard that, our heads fairly exploded. Even now, 30 years later, you hear it and you're like, yeah, they were on to something. And I remember one night at Georgetown University, I was sitting in some punk rock girl's dorm, I think it was uh, Andrea. She was, one of, she was one of the crew and she was going to Georgetown. And that was, in those days, you just find places and dwell. Do you remember that time in your young years, you just go hang out at people's houses, like like it? Do you even do anything. Go, let's go to your place and do this. And like mold, you would migrate and sit and be completely useless. And so one night I was sitting in this small room with Andrea as Andrea and I think a girl named Vivian were applying peroxide to HR's very young dreadlocks. And if you look at later photos of him, you'll see the very ends of his dreadlocks spiked in peroxide yellow. That was from that night. And me being kind of like the boy scout, I said, so HR exactly what are those lyrics? And he said, well, I'll tell them to you. And Andrea gave me a piece of notebook paper, and he said the lyrics to me very slowly, and I wrote them all down like an apt pupil. And you probably think that I'm filling you full of whimsy. And I say, no, no, fanatic. 30 years later, I still have that piece of paper. Because... I knew I was holding on to one of the great documents of our time. And so, many months after that, HR fell upon hard times, as many musicians were wont to do in those days, and he found himself fairly homeless. I think my mom was feeding him at one point. HR came by! It was really great! My mom was pretty far out. Anyway, I was walking down the, in the Adams Morgan, uh, the Adams Morgan district, and there's HR standing in front of the A&P near the Ontario Theatre, we also the Clash February 15, 1979. I was 18 years and two days old. Anyway, no diddly opening. Come on. And so there's HR in a trench coat kind of stomping his feet, being a cold man. And I said, Hi, HR. He said, Hey, come here. I came over there. He opened up his trench coat and he produced two cassettes. He said, Hold on to these for me. And I said, Okay. And to this day, I'm still holding on to them. Well, he didn't tell me to do anything else, so to, I still hold. One is his copy of the Bad Brains demo that eventually became the Black Dots album. I will produce that presently. Um, and the other thing, I, I was staring at it, and I went, well, I can understand the writing. It says Bad Brains, second show. 
Bad Brains, second show. So here's the cassette of the second ever Bad Brains show, performed in a hippie commune called Madams Organ in the Adams Morgan district. Madams Organ was a, basically a house with a bunch of uh, long hairs living inside who were cool to punk rock, and for two dollars you could walk in, and if you didn't want to pay, the, the, the smiling hippie at the door would say, it's cool, and you could walk in for free. And they would have these amazing punk rock gigs in there, and you could stand like a foot away from the Bad Brains and get sweated on by the band. And all kinds of bands played at Adam's Organ. It was, just, it was a great time. There's no fights. It was all the, the Rastas and the punks and everyone was weird and cool. And if you walked in there, everyone was nice to you. It's kind of like the Bobby Bird lyric. I know you got sold because if you didn't, you wouldn't be in here. And so if you knew enough to get in there, you must be okay. And so I, uh, I figured we better listen to a little bit of the second ever Bad Brain show because that's certainly a rare occurrence. And you're going to listen to the Bad Brain second ever show performing pay to come. Are you ready? Pay to come. never left my house. The only person I know has a copy of it would be Ian, so I'm glad I got a chance to play that. Now, the, the demo tape that HR gave me was a tape that we all had in varying uh, conditions of the wrong tape speed. It was a tape that the Bad Brains recorded in Regeer Studios where all the early Discord stuff was done in August of 1979, a few weeks after we saw them open for the damp. Eventually, these tapes were remixed by Don Zintera and released on the Caroline album, Black Dots. If you pick up any single Bad Brains record, this is the one. And it's just my rock and roll theory, but my theory is, had this been released as a proper album, within weeks or months after it had been recorded, like at some point in 1979, it would have changed how independent music developed in this country because the record is a smoking uh, bit of work. It, it doesn't sound like a demo. It sounds like a band who is better than anything you were ever going to do to magnetic tape. And the fact that it only came out in like 1990-something is it's too bad because the, the rest of America and the world should have heard this when we heard it because the Bad Brains for us was this thing that we would tell anyone we could. You wake up dead people. The Bad Brains! Because there was nothing like it. Now, in the summer of 1983, a 20-year-old Ian Mackay ventured in to uh, Inner Ear Studios and had his way with a four-track Bad Brains tape that had been sitting there all of those years. And so I'm going to play you uh, the original version of the song, then I'm going to play you Ian's remix that he only put on to cassette. You've never heard it. It's never gone anywhere. We're going to listen to a song by the Bad Brains. It's on the Black Dots album. We're going to play the Black Dots version. It's a song called The Man Won't Annoy You. We'll listen to a little bit of it, and then we'll listen to Ian's version of it. The Man Won't Annoy You.
very, very good song. Ian went in and, and with a beautiful four-track machine, uh, made his own very, very interesting and very, very innovative dub mix. And this is Ian at like 20, 21, 19 years of age. He's an extraordinary producer. He, he has a very amazing mind. And I got to DC, I was visiting him, and he said, check this out. And he played me this, and he knocked me out. So I've been listening to this song forever. So now we're going to hear Ian's mix of the man Lord Annoyed. I, I want to make sure I get this right. Don't we'll screw it up. Okay, good. Here we go. And this is Ian's mix. ST Records, and I was uh, the mail guy. I'd answer all the mail. If you wrote me, I wrote you back. If you hit me, I hit you back. Anyway, we get this incoming mail from an attorney. An attorney sends us two cassettes from his client that he's representing. He said, I'm representing this client. He's a great songwriter. I want you to listen to the tapes, evaluate them, and see if you like to exploit this man's masters. And so I said, okay, who's that? Who's the client? Oh, 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 Charles Manson. Well, now. And so I said, well, we better play this music. So I pop it into the community boom box, and everyone says, what the hell is going on? I said, it's Charles Manson by way of his lawyer. And so we listened to the music, and we said, well, this is pretty interesting. And all the, uh, the higher-ups at SST, they were busy doing something. And uh, they said, Henry, this is your assignment. Listen to the tapes, make your evaluation. So I dragged them back to the small room I was living in. I, got, I, I had graduated from the broken van in the liquor store parking lot. I had now had digs of my own, which is a small storage room where I slept on a very cold and moldy floor with a pillow under my hip and it, with bugs would crawl on me. And, and I, had a, I had a cassette player. And I listened to this music. And I get back to the SST the next day. They said, well, I said, I think there's an album 
album here. It's, it's pretty good. It's prison recordings. It's Charles Manson in his cell, but the lyrics are interesting. The playing is good. I, it would get us into a hell of a lot of trouble. Maybe we should check this out. And so Greg and Chuck Pekowski basically said, Green light! And so I write Charles Manson a letter. Dear Mr. Manson, I am your editor slash producer. My name is Henry. I remember you because many years ago I read Elder Skelter. I was at home with a cold for a few days and I read it all. I found it to be a very terrifying tale, sir. That being said, I think we have an album here. Don't know if it's ready for prime time, but I'm going to do my best to make you a good record. He responded by sending another cassette. And in this cassette, he gives his location. You'll hear Charles Manson say at the beginning of this track, this is SST Recording Studio. It is overwhelmingly intense. Oh, let's listen right now. This is SST Recording Studio.
Hello. I uh, put these songs together, and I took all these cassettes to Radio Tokyo in Venice, California, and I set them all up, and I said to the board op, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. He goes, what are we doing? I said, that's uh, Charles Manson, and like, you know, the, the blood drains from the face over the music. I can hear your hair growing out there. He has that effect on people. And so the oldest guy gave me like these incredibly angry books. We edited this thing together to quarter-inch tape. And then I took it to K-Disc to John Golden to master this thing. And John Golden did all of the SST stuff, all the Black Flag stuff. He now has John Golden mastering. He's still mastering to this day. He's a jolly fellow. He's like one of those overwhelmingly professional and wonderful guys. He's, he's just always buoyant and happy to see you. So I walk in, he's like, so hey, what are we doing today? I said, Charles Mance. He's like, okay, so let's get started. He recovered marvelously. And so we made an album for Charles Manson called Completion. And uh, it was just one of his poems that he sent me. And I said, well, we'll name the, the album Completion. He wrote, he said, that works for me. And I said, I don't know if you're going to get to hear this thing. I don't know what the regulations are. And so we made uh, five Five test pressings of this LP, and uh, this is what it looks like. Um, the album never came out. SST, uh, the word leaked of the album to the LA Times, the LA Times did an article about it, and we started getting some of the most amazingly terrifying death threats at all hours. The phone would ring. Click. And Greg said, we're not putting out this record. I'm like, oh, come on. Let's do it. What? Three death threats an hour. Come on. And he said, no, they're threatening us and we're not going to do it. So the record was scuttled. It never came out. It exists. Uh, the, the quarter inch tapes perhaps reside at SST. Two of the five test pressings reside with me. I think uh, the other three reside uh, with other SST constituents. It was a very, very odd time. And on a much more pleasant note, let's move on to one of the greatest LA bands ever, a band called The Gun Club. Jeffrey Lee Pierce of the Gun Club. I can tell that you know and understand Jeffrey. Jeffrey left us many years ago. He died. Jeffrey Lee Pierce was one of the greatest, most underrated songwriters in America, in my opinion. His lyrics were beautiful and poetic. He was a true songwriter. He was also a very lovable guy, and he was a real screw-up. He could not stay away from the toxins that eventually killed him. And I became very close to Jeffrey because he did his lyric book on my label. And quite often in the afternoon, he would come over with his mother, and they would spread lyric sheets all over the, my office floor. We would sort through them and gather and collate them, and then later became Go Tell the Mountain, the Jeffrey Lee lyric book. And at one point, I wanted to release Gun Club albums that had only come out in Europe, like Mother Juno, Divinity, Pastoral Hide and Seek, because America had never heard these records. And so I got the licensing deal done, and I'm about to release the records, and before they could come out, Jeffrey Lee passed away. And after he passed away, his wonderful sister Jackie gave me a Gun Club demo tape, which to my knowledge has never been released. I have every Gun Club record that I've ever been able to find, and I cannot find any of these tracks on any of those records. So right now, we're going to listen to a really beautiful demo version of a song that was on the second Gun Club album called Miami. The song is called Mother Earth, and it's just one of the most divinely beautiful songs. If you ever get a chance, I would recommend checking out the entirety of the Gun Club catalog. I believe there is a box set that represents Jeffrey and his recorded output rather well. He was an astonishingly talented guy, and he had an amazing life. He would live like Arthur Rambeau. He would come over to my place and show me these photos of men standing in a rice paddy with like with oxen, men wearing those straw hats. I go, wow, that's Vietnam, 1960. What? He goes like, oh no, that's last week. I've been living in Vietnam for six months. He would just go on these crazy trips like, where's Jeffrey now? Who knows? Wherever the wind would take him. And for me, he was the first blues legend I ever met, who was like a ghost while you were standing in front of him, you realized he's like Robert Johnson. He's going to be way bigger after he's dead. Everyone's going to claim to have known him, yet few would have ever understand him. He's one of the great enigmas of my life, trying to understand the genius of this guy. So let's get into it right now with the Gun Club. I'm 
experience of, of meeting someone who has the cloud over their head like not that they're a downer but you know for sure without a doubt in your mind that they are not long for this world that there's no way they're going to be 60 years old and you're never going to grow old with that person every time i saw jeffrey that was the feeling i got no way is he getting through this no way is he making 50. and unfortunately i, I was right about that but i think perhaps some of you have met that person and, and they're, they're amazing they're wonderful and they're just not going to make it he was that guy. Uh, I've met a few others. Uh, Jeff Buckley, you know, I, I would see him in New York, and he's like this beautiful, wonderful, friendly guy, always walking around with one of the most insanely beautiful women. Hey, Henry, this is, and the girl had no interest in, she's like, <sighs> and you'd see him play, like, how can anyone sing that well? It must be eating him up inside, and with every, with every lyric that would come out of his mouth, he's just taking days off his life, because no one can be that good and survive, and eventually, you know, he passed away too, but I, I, that cloud was always over, and I, I, I knew it, and I'm not a, one of those spiritual people. Believe me, I'm really not, but he had that thing. So I'm not trying to bum you out. Uh, some band called The Meat Puppets. For a long time, they recorded on SST Records. This is a band that had one of the most amazing repertoires. It's like, play an Elvis song, and all of a sudden they would play 30 of Elvis Presley's greatest hits. And they toured with Black Flag as, as our opening band in the summer of 1984. And almost every single set would be different. One night, they went out and did our set. Like, thanks a lot. And then, you know, the next night they go out and they play Beat It, Thriller, and then half of, uh, of, of the first ZZ Top album, and just to make the audiences mad. Because Black Flag audiences were not the most open-minded people all the time. And there's the meat puppets up there with their dyed green long hair. So our audience is like, fucking dang it! Yeah, nice, right? And to which the meat puppets would just go, oh, 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 and go into a rage for like 20 minutes. And then the punk rock is like, ah! I just couldn't take it. And so when Spock or Joe Carducci together, I think they produced the first SST record, the first album of the Meat Puppets. The Meat Puppets between songs would play other songs. And I knew I had some of these outtakes on cassette. And so I dug up the Meat Puppets from, I think, 1981, playing Up Around the Bend. This is awesome. <laughs>
performed it as they played it. I got a, a, a true outtake from the first Bean Puppets record. And uh, I'm going to be very succinct with this, but I could go all night on this one tangent, but I'm not really, because it's a school night. In Washington, D.C., in the early 80s, uh, people I grew up with, people like Ian MacKay and Guy Machado, uh, there's many young geniuses, Michael Hampton, uh, Mike Fellows, all these people who formed bands like Fugazi, Rice of Spring, One Last Wish. These people were so insanely creative, I cannot overemphasize just how bloody talented these young people were. So all of them had their band they were doing at the time, and then like many people who were very creative, they had like five other bands to take the surplus of their great genius. And a lot of these bands, they wouldn't take themselves very seriously. I thought it was some of the best music I ever heard. So whenever I would come to Washington, D.C., I would bug all of them, give me the new cassettes. And they knew that I was mad for all of their fake bathroom bands or bedroom bands. They would just like make up these bands like Guy Pachoto was all of a sudden, Guy Pachoto and the Pumps. And they just had all these, you know, like 20 new songs. Or the Guy Pachoto Project, or the Dancing Crabs, and there's all these fake D.C. bands. And, and hardly any of them made records. One band, The Snakes, made two records. The Brief Weeds actually made two 45s on the K label. And this is all these young people bursting with amazing talent. And they always say, Henry, why do you want these cassettes? These songs are so stupid. I go, no, they're not stupid. You guys are amazing. These songs are hilarious. You guys are geniuses. And I can't get enough. And so I was always the guy taking the tapes away. Of course, these tapes would be taped over by these guys. So a year later, I'm the only person holding on to these tapes. Now that they're all baby booming, now that they're all coming around and coming to middle age, hey, Henry, do you have that tape? Of course I have that tape. I'm the guy who holds on to everything. In 1997, I got a CDR maker, and the first CDR I made was the second ever Bad Brain show, and then I followed up with all the rare DC stuff. Now, the uh, band, The Brief Weeds, this is Guy Pachoto, it was Mike Hampton, Eddie Jenny, and I think uh, Brendan Canty on drums. Half of that band later became The Rites of Spring, half of that band later became Fugazi. And the, the Brief Weeds was a concept band. They would all cop fake English accents and like wear bad paisley clothes and play these 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 songs where they would make the lyrics as, as, as wretched as they could. So you'd be like, what are you doing? But it was at the same time really, really good music because they're that talented even when they're trying to suck. They are fairly freaking magnificent. And they made two singles. You can find them. There's one track from one of them that ended up on a K Records compilation, I think. But this is a song called uh, Ambrosia, Ambrosia 2, where Guy, even trying to be funny, he's so damn talented, he ends up writing one of the most beautiful broken heart lyrics I have ever heard in my life. It is exquisitely gorgeous. If you can, pick out the lyrics where he basically, he says, anything that you bring to this woman, she's going to laugh it away, you know, but yet I, you, know, you are still attracted to her. It is a beautiful lyric, a beautiful song, and the whole time, oh, he's just kidding around. And, and so when people have that kind of talent, it's, uh, well, we're going to listen to it right now, enough of my gum flapping, but there's so much of that music, I could play all those different bands for another three hours and really wear you out. <laughs> The Fat Project had one. The Fat Peter Jackson. She is floating, contact, floating, a gorgeous, a tapestry for Your treasures are 
So uh, this show does have some direction. What do you think? It, it just keeps songs keep coming out and blah 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 blah. Will he ever shut up? I will eventually shut up. So we're gonna listen to one last song, and uh, I know if you go on all night. Believe me, if my living room could hold all of you, I'd invite you over, and we would do this until the break of dawn. But maybe we should get together at some other time and do this all over again. Admittedly, it will take me quite a while to gather something with the strength of what I brought you tonight, because, fanatics, I gave you some of my top shelf gear. <laughs> but with time, I'll accumulate more. And so let's see if I get this right. Hopefully I have the right track. Um, the first ever Fugazi Demo, a song that needs no introduction. I think you've heard this one before, but perhaps not this version.
Now that was a damn show. I think I have pretty good taste in music. But what I do have for sure is one amazing audience. Thank you so much for showing up tonight. And if you look at all the nice seats that you're sitting under, uh, sitting on top of, they don't usually reside in this venue. Many of you have been in this wonderful building many nights of your life. All these couches were brought in. I'm going to read off some credits, some special thank yous that we don't want to uh, leave anyone out. Uh, Mitchell Frank for his hospitality and lending us this Echoplex for the evening. And uh, all the wonderful upholstery, all the wonderful couches was Keith Greco, Greco Decor. We thank him for dolling up the place so nicely. Uh, Jennifer Farrow, otherwise known as General Chen. We'd like to thank her for being our wonderful leader and general manager at KCRW, a true visionary who's going to take us strength to strength in this bold and new century. I'd like to thank Liz McDonald for producing tonight's show. She's out there somewhere. Also, wonderful thank yous go out to Rachel Reynolds, our wonderful press liaison, uh, Pamela B., or as we say, Pamela B. <laughs> Valerie Barrett, Shara Cook, and Matt Geary. And as you know, fanatics, you can check me out uh, from 1,800 to 2,000 hours every Saturday evening at the K89.9 KCRW. And from the fight deck, myself, your humble fanatic in chief, I bid all of you adieu and salam alaikum. Thanks for coming. Good night, everyone.